Long after this, he discovered that he was infected. The doctor who treated him wouldn't have told him that he had syphilis. They didn't in those days, because it was incurable. Even so, as a result of this incident, Nietzsche appears to have abstained from sexual activity with women. Despite this, he continued throughout his life to make embarrassingly self-revealing remarks about them in his philosophy. You are going to see a woman? Do not forget your whip. Although it's possible that, owing to the type of bordello he had visited in Leipzig, he thought it only fair that men should be equally armed for the fray. The second life-changing incident took place when he entered a second-hand bookshop and came across a copy of Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation. I took the unfamiliar book in my hands and began leafing through the pages. I don't know what demon it was that whispered in my ear, Take this book home. So, breaking my principle of never buying a book too quickly, I did just that. Back home I threw myself into the corner of the sofa with my new treasure, and began to let that dynamic, gloomy genius work on my mind. I found myself looking into a mirror which reflected the world, life, and my own nature with terrifying grandeur. Here I saw sickness and health, exile and refuge, hell and heaven. As a result of these astonishingly prophetic sentiments, Nietzsche became a Schopenhauerian. At this time, when Nietzsche had nothing to believe in, he needed Schopenhauer's pessimism and detachment. According to Schopenhauer, the world is merely representation, supported by an all-pervasive evil will. This will is blind, and pays no attention to the concerns of mere humanity, inflicting upon its members a life of suffering as they strive against its manifestation all around them, the world. Our only sensible course is to lessen the power of the will within us by living a life of renunciation and asceticism. Schopenhauer's pessimism didn't quite fit Nietzsche's nature, but he at once recognized its honesty and power. From now on, his positive ideas would first have to be of sufficient strength to go beyond this pessimism. The way forward lay through Schopenhauer. But most of all, Schopenhauer's concept of the fundamental role played by the will was to prove decisive. This was eventually to become transformed into Nietzsche's will to power. In 1867, Nietzsche was called up for a year's national service in the Prussian army. The authorities were obviously fooled by the large and ferocious military moustache that Nietzsche had now cultivated beneath his rather disappointing dueling scar, and he was dispatched to the cavalry. This was a mistake. Nietzsche had great determination, but a pitifully frail physique. He suffered a serious riding accident, and then rode on as if nothing had happened, in the best Prussian tradition. When Private Nietzsche made it back to barracks, he had to be hospitalized for a month. He was promoted to Lance Corporal for effort, and then sent home. Back at Leipzig University, Nietzsche was now recognized by his professor as the finest student he had seen in forty years. Yet Nietzsche was becoming disenchanted with philology and its indifference towards the true and urgent problems of life. He didn't know what to do. In desperation, he thought of switching to chemistry, or going off to Paris for a year to try the divine can-can and the yellow poison absinthe. Then one day he managed to secure an introduction to the composer Richard Wagner, who was on an undercover visit to the city. Wagner had been banished for revolutionary activities twenty years earlier, and the ban remained, despite the transformation of his extremist political views from left to right. Wagner had been born in the same year as Nietzsche's father, and from all accounts bore a striking resemblance to him. Nietzsche felt a desperate but largely unconscious need for a father figure. He had never met a famous artist before, nor someone whose ideas were apparently so in accord with his own. In the course of their brief meeting, Nietzsche discovered Wagner's deep love of Schopenhauer. Wagner, flattered by the attentions of the brilliant young philosopher, turned on his considerable charm to the full. The effect on Nietzsche was immediate and profound. 
he was overwhelmed by the great composer, whose flamboyant character was at least the equal of his flamboyant operas. Two months later, Nietzsche was offered the post of Professor of Philology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. He was still only twenty-four, and had not yet even taken his doctorate. Despite his misgivings about philology, this was an offer he could not refuse. In April 1869, he took up his post at Basel, and at once began giving extra lectures in philosophy. He wished to combine philosophy and philology, the study of aesthetics and the classics, welding together an instrument for analysing the faults of our civilization, no less. He quickly established himself as the rising young star of the university, and became acquainted with Jakob Burkhardt, the great cultural historian, who was also a member of the university faculty. Burkhardt, who was the first to elaborate the historical concept of the Renaissance, was the only mind of a calibre similar to Nietzsche's among the faculty, and perhaps the only figure Nietzsche was to remain in awe of throughout his life. It's possible that Burkhardt might, at this crucial stage, have exercised a steadying influence on Nietzsche, but his patrician reserve was to prevent this. And besides, the role of father figure had already been taken by a far less steadying influence. In Basel, Nietzsche was only forty miles from Tripschen, where Wagner had taken up residence with Cosima, Liszt's daughter, who was at the time still married to a mutual friend of Liszt and Wagner, the conductor von Bülow. In no time Nietzsche became a regular weekend visitor to Wagner's sumptuous villa on the shores of Lake Lucerne. But Wagner's life was operatic in more than just musical, emotional, and political terms. He was a man who believed in living out his fantasies to the full. Tribschen was like an opera in itself, and there was never any doubt about who was playing the leading role. Dressed in the Flemish style, a blend of the Flying Dutchman and Rubens in fancy dress, Wagner strode beneath the pink satin walls and rococo cherubs in his black satin breeches, tam shanter and effusively knotted silk cravat, declaiming among the busts of himself vast oil paintings of the same subject, and silver bowls commemorating performances of his operas. Incense wafted through the air, and only the music of the maestro was allowed to waft with it. Meanwhile, Cosima ministered to her companion's histrionics, and made sure no one ran off with the perfumed pet lambs, beribboned wolfhounds, and ornamental chickens that roamed the garden. It's difficult to understand how Nietzsche was taken in by all this. Indeed, it's difficult to understand how anyone was taken in by it. Wagner's extravagances left him constantly broke, and he relied on support from a string of rich benefactors, including King Ludwig of Bavaria, who contributed heavily from the state exchequer. Only when one listens to Wagner's music does the deep persuasiveness and fatal charm of his character become conceivable. The composer himself was evidently as overwhelming as his spell-binding compositions. The immature Nietzsche quickly fell under the spell of this heady atmosphere, where leet motifs of unconscious fantasy permeated the Rococo salons. Wagner may have been dad, but Nietzsche soon found he had an edible itch for Cosima. Without daring to declare it, even to himself, he fell in love with her. In July 1870, the Franco-Prussian War broke out. This was Prussia's chance to avenge its defeat by Napoleon, its opportunity to conquer the French and establish Germany as the major power in Europe. Filled with patriotic fervour, Nietzsche volunteered for service as a medical orderly. Passing through Frankfurt on his way to the front, he witnessed the lines of cavalry clattering through the streets in full regalia. It was as if a scale fell from his eyes. I felt, for the first time, that the strongest and highest will to life is not to be found in the struggle for existence, but in a will to power, a will to war and domination. The will to power had been born, and though it was to go through considerable modification, eventually being seen in individual and social rather than purely military terms, it was never to break quite free from its original military inspiration. Meanwhile, as Bismarck crushed the French, Nietzsche was to discover that war was not all glory. 
On the battlefield at Wörthe, he found himself working amidst a scene bespattered everywhere with human remains and reeking pungently of corpses. Later he was put into a cattle truck to tend six wounded men on a journey which lasted over two days. Locked in among the shattered bones, 